lies. Look, I wanted to read Psalm 23. Elena posted it on Text Church this morning. And, and, and at the end of the day, I was like, you know what? I think that this can go along with the message that I have. So I wanted to read a passage of scripture to you because I always like reading scripture. Amen. And so that's what I'm going to read to you. Psalm chapter 23. Haley, if you can put it up there. If not, if you have your Bible, you can follow along with me. I'm going to read under the King James Version. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. I want you to point, I want to point that out to you, that he leads us beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I titled my message tonight, A Raging River in My Soul. It was interesting how y'all's song talked about a river, but it was talking about, I think, a calm river. It was talking about a river that would be more like, uh, you know, th that could describe... Uh, tranquility and and peace, Amen. I, I should have. Uh, I was gonna have some pictures for y'all, but I didn't have any pictures. And well, I didn't. I didn't hook my iPad up, and I don't know where my where my eraser is. So I don't know how well this is gonna work. But I want to give you like a little bit of a picture. Y'all know how a lot of times I would draw this picture of Israel would be in between here. This would be the Sea of Galilee. This is the Jordan River. This is the Dead Sea. If you could really look on a map, though, and I'm probably not going to do a very good job of it, but there's a, it's called the Jordan Valley. So the river lies in a valley, and, and they call it also the Jordan Rift System. Have you ever, has anybody ever been to Arkansas and gone kayaking in Arkansas before? No. Uh, well, if you go to Arkansas, they have these bluffs. They're called lock. It's like made out of lime. And it's on the sides of the rivers in there. And so it's, it's kind of like a ledge. It's, it's a mountainous area, but the mountains, are they have limestone, right? That's actually the terrain that's in Israel. The, 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 the valley is, is limestone that goes up and it ascends into mountains. And so what's interesting is, is that they have these things that are called wadis, W-A-D-I. And these wadis are formed over a period of time from the rains that come through on the sides right here, on the sides of the ledges that come down from the mountains, and they create crevices, deep crevices, and they're kind of like, they almost form a reservoir. But what can happen is that when we went to Arkansas, we had brought the girls, and we went kayaking in this area where they had these little bluffs that were on the side. And one, the, this fella told me, he said, you know, about two months ago, just two months ago, he said the water rose before you knew it. There were campers that lost their life. He said because whenever they get a flash rain, it comes down off the mountain so rapidly and the river swells up and it just came in and people were just sleeping in their camper and didn't even know it and they just drowned and died. And so there's, there's an idea behind this psalm. There's an added level to it that, that, the, that, the, shepherd, that, that the Lord is his shepherd. You know, he, he is leading his sheep like a shepherd would lead sheep to find green pastures and to find still waters. See, sometimes there's danger, right? Whenever they're a shepherd in the physical, there's danger. And they're trying to find safety for their sheep to be able to get them to a place where they can drink and where they can eat, where they can be nourished. And the psalmist, he was a shepherd himself and he's writing this song. But what he's saying is, is that the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And he's going to lead me to green pastures and he's going to lead me to still waters. 
So what I want you to know really off of that is this, is that no matter what we're going through, no matter what we've been through, and the things that we faced in life, we can have faith. And look, the Lord's really been putting that on my heart lately. Faith in his word. We can have faith in God and his word to know that he is going to go before us and he is going to protect us. And no matter what we're going through and no matter what we're facing, the Lord wants you to know that if you will trust him and believe his word, he will will get you through what you're going through. Amen. I want you to know that. You know, I don't know about you, but I think a lot about the characters in the Bible. And many times after I've preached several messages while I'm praying, I'll just think about all the messages I've preached. Maybe that's an advantage of being the guy that studies for these messages and having all of this information constantly rolling around in my heart. And whenever I pray, all of these things are coming back to my mind. But I think a lot about the Bible characters and especially in the messages that I've preached. But I also think about you guys a lot. I think, I think I mean, you may not, maybe you think about me sometimes, but and maybe you, you probably think about your, your, your close loved ones, right? But you may not think about other people in the church, but I have a tendency to think about all of y'all, especially when I'm in here praying and I'll think about you and I'm praying for you. And I kind of know some of your stories a little bit. Some of y'all I know a lot. And, and I think about that and I think about what you, what you might have been through in your life. You know what I'm saying? And, and what you're going through. And, and, and I think, you know, um, about those things. And, and I wonder, though, with the Bible characters that I recently preached, what happened to Tamar after Amnon threw her out and locked the door? You know, the story of Tamar and Amnon after he treated her improperly and then he and then he threw her outside and he locked the door. Right. What 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 could have Absalom done differently that would have prevented his anger and bitterness and wouldn't have resulted in his tragic death? What made the little girl from Israel that got caught up in a skirmish? Y'all remember the story in Kings, Naaman the leper? Y'all remember that? And it says that there was a little girl, and she got caught up in a skirmish. She was an Israelite girl, and she was taken from her family, and she was brought and forced to serve in Naaman the leper's home. I wonder, what, what was it about that little girl that helped her to stay hopeful? Even after she was taken captive and forced out of her family's life. How was she not full of sorrow? And she ends up actually witnessing the name. I mean, I might have this thing completely wrong because look, sometimes the Bible doesn't tell us the whole story. As a matter of fact, the Bible really seldomly tells us the whole story. What I'm trying to tell you is the Bible is written in a very synoptic way, a synopsis. You get little pieces of information. It's telling us a little girl, but it doesn't tell me her age. The big difference between an eight-year-old and a 14-year-old. Right, right. Okay? It doesn't really tell me for sure what she looked like, but in my mind, I see her skipping around full of joy. Oh, I wish that you could see the prophet in Israel, Master. I wish that you could go over there and see him because he would heal you of your leprosy. Now, maybe she wasn't that excited. I don't know, but that's what I imagine in my mind. And you can't tell me that she wasn't doing that because the Bible's quiet and silent on that. But it says that she said, I would that my master would see the prophet in Israel because he would be healed. Right. Amen. Right. What, would have, what would have happened to, to Peter after the denial had Jesus not helped him? And you know, I'm thinking about Paul, too. Did Paul just conveniently forget Stephen's stoning? Some of you may not even know some of these Bible stories. I hope you do. I hope you've been reading your Bible. It's easier to preach to people that read their Bible. Amen. Uh, and I know that many of you have been reading your Bible. That's what I love about this church. I'm telling you, I've been teaching a Bible study to people that are at a different level than you guys. And so we've been working together for a long time on the Word of God. And that's one of the things that I feel like sometimes whenever the Word of God can go forth, it goes forth with free course. It can just have its way because I can talk to you about certain characters in the Word of God. But if you'll remember, Stephen was the first martyr talked about in the book of Acts. And the, the Bible says that they laid their coats at one named Saul, meaning he was giving them permission to stone Stephen. And he was right there whenever the Bible says that heaven opened up and that, that, that Stephen saw 
the image of Jesus and that Jesus was standing up. Oh, that's so good right there, church. I've preached it many times. But the Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. But when he saw Stephen taking a stand for the truth and being stoned, it caused Jesus to get up. Hallelujah. And I can see him over there telling him, go too quick, boy. You're almost there. You're about to come home and you're about to come into glory. Hallelujah. But I wonder about that, about old Paul. Did he just conveniently forget that stoning? The Bible doesn't really talk about it. Oh, I mean, do you reckon that there was probably a time that's just not mentioned in Scripture where he was overwhelmed with sorrow yeah, yeah. for the things that he had done in the past? Surely he allowed God to heal his heart and turn his failures into victories instead of letting the devil use them in his life to make him want to quit. Amen. He must have allowed the Holy Spirit to enter in to those deep places of his soul and bring healing. Or, or do you think that he just buried those thoughts somewhere deep in his heart in one of those little compartments that I like that we talk about the soul, you know, throw it in a room, just put it out of my mind, lock the door, forget about it. All right. Yes, sir. Close the door, lock it, forget about it. I don't know. The Bible doesn't talk about it. I have a feeling that he didn't do that. I have a feeling that he had remorse yes. over the, the pain and the heartache that he caused. I have a feeling that he convulsed in repentance. I can't prove it to you. I just know that the times that I have let the Lord down and when the Holy Spirit comes back and gets all over me, I find myself convulsing in repentance sometimes. So I know good and well the Apostle Paul, with the way the Holy Spirit was working in his life, came clean with the Lord and let the Holy Spirit have his way. And I'm pretty sure that Paul would have known about the song that we preached on that says, Search my heart, O Lord, and try the reins. Yes. Look deep down on the inside of me. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. Turn it on, Lord. Start searching. Amen. Amen. But we do know this, that in the world there are tribulations. Amen. And that word means to be pressed. And so life is full of trials that cause pressure. And pressure that we just try to pretend isn't there is not really being properly dealt with. Yeah, These true. hidden problems can be quiet and peaceful one moment and then the next swell into a raging river. Hurts and pains can occur any time along the lifespan. We can hurt as a child, get hurt as a child by our parents, right? Some people have had harsh childhoods. Yeah. I don't know each and every person's stories. I know some people in here, but I can tell you there's some people in here that have had some harsh childhoods. And they grow up in an environment where there may have been some type of abuse, mm. verbal, physical, sexual. Sometimes not even that. Maybe, maybe just neglect. You know, I'm not trying to be weird. Hopefully nobody in here has long, dirty fingernails. But sometimes I see kids, little kids that come into the clinic and their fingernails are long and there's dirt all up under their fingernails. If you're watching the video and your kids have dirty fingernails, please can't clean your kids' fingernails. I mean, it's, it's not, it's actually, kind of, you know what I'm saying? It's like, no, but it's true. The poor child can't clean their fingernails. And, and maybe some people would, there's even worse than that. Like, cleanliness is one thing, but what about if you just grow up in a home where you just don't feel like you're loved? Where you just don't feel like your mom and your dad loved you because they really just barely tolerated you, you know? I, I, I know that you, most of you people are pretty seasoned in the word, and um, a lot of people maybe even watching that will watch on video are probably wondering, well, what must I do? What, what I believe is this, is that you must learn to allow God to heal your hurts. Yes. You can't just lock it in a room somewhere in your soul, yeah, in your mind, the memories, and shut them off and try to suppress them. You need to let God minister to you. Yeah, that's good. No, I'm good, preacher. I'm a man, and now you're talking girl stuff. Feelings and all that kind of stuff. Well, maybe you think right now you don't need healing from hurt that has been caused to you. But is it possible that someone else needs healing from hurt that has been caused by you? Right. That's good. That's good. In one of the recent messages that I preached, I mentioned that the veil is torn. And access has been granted into the presence of the Lord. Amen. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. Where the presence of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. Maybe the way to the song. There is freedom. I can't say it. Right. 
You know what I'm talking about. When we enter in and let him minister to these places of hurt that are in our hearts. Amen. Have we led him into the deep places of our hearts to turn on the light, to search the heart, and to look and to see? And not just for sin, but also what about looking for sick spots, disease, infections of the heart, poisonous plants, roots of bitterness that have been placed by other people? Or will we let, or will we let him reveal the hurts that we have caused others, you know? Sometimes whenever we get along with the Lord and we let the Holy Spirit deal with our hearts, he will reveal to us whenever we've treated someone improperly and he'll bring it back to our heart and our mind. And then the right thing to do at that point in time is to come clean with the Lord. But in addition to that, to come clean with that person. We're supposed to, if we think that our brother has all against us or we're supposed to prefer our brother over ourselves, we are supposed to get, if we have, the word of God says, if you have, if, if you have all in your heart towards your brother, if there's a problem with you and your brother, you're supposed to leave your gift at the altar and you're supposed to go to your brother. Yeah. Amen? Or your yeah. sister, whenever right. you've hurt people. That's right. You know? Yeah. Some people say, no, I like, like just locking it away. I'd rather do it that way. And people do that. Don't think, you know, some of y'all in this place are probably famous for that. I'm just saying. Lock it away in the compartment. Hide it. That works for me. No, it really doesn't. And you know why? I'm going to tell you why. Because sometimes... This becomes a weight in your life. And what I mean by that is the word of God says that there's weights that can beset us. Many times these very things, these traumatic events or these, these hurts, these, these things that have taken place in our life, they turn into weights and they start to mess up our race. The weights of life. And they try to impede our progress. It's in the, 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 the strong dictionary calls it an encumbrance, a bulky weight. If you can imagine, I mean, I bought some weights on purpose to run. I think I used it one time in a thing. But I mean, but any kind of weight that you put on you, it will prevent you from being able to make the progress in the race that God is wanting us to be able to make. Amen. And so many times these things and it's not. And again, weights are not sins. Sins are weights, but weights are not necessarily sins. Many times the weights are things that have taken place in our life that other people have caused against us. And, and if we don't learn how to bring it into the, the presence of the Lord and allow the, the Lord to heal our hearts, then we may, if we're not careful, become frustrated and irritated and a root of bitterness will try to come into our heart, amen, and it will try to jam us up and prevent us from being able to move forward. So I want to encourage you to know that that's the beauty of the veil being torn. And i got to keep saying this because I believe that it's an important practice that we all have to learn as Christians yes. to get into the presence of the Lord. Yes. Now listen, it's not easy whenever you, I see young mamas in here, I see... I see daddies that, you know what I'm saying, that are raising their children that work all day long. I get it. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's easy. Uh, it's not. But I'm telling you, if you will learn, because look, Jesus died on the cross. And the Bible says when he died, the veil was torn. And what that means is, is that you have access into the presence of God. And if you will learn how to access the presence of God, maybe after the kids are asleep. You just put on a little bit of worship music and you start That's off real good. simple. That's you just call on his name. That's you just call on his name. You just say, you know, I don't know. I wish I could sing, but I, I, was, I woke up this morning with a song in my heart. I did. I, and, you know, isn't that beautiful when you wake up, you know, with scripture in your heart? Bill used to tell me, dude, I woke up again this morning with scripture in my heart. Hallelujah. It doesn't happen all the time. But when it does, isn't it good? Oh, yeah. This is the song. Amen. Y'all ready? Okay. Here we go. Right. Should I give a microphone to somebody? <laughs> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Hallelujah. Turn your eyes on Jesus is what I'm trying to tell you. I wish I could do a better job of singing, but turn your eyes upon Jesus. Hallelujah. When you wake up and you feel down, don't get out of the bed till you start singing. I turn my eyes to you, O oh Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me to green pastures. He leads me beside. 
by still waters. Hallelujah. He restored my soul. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, I've come to this truth in my heart that the further we as a church move towards God's will for us as a church and really as individuals, uh, I want you to know that, um, you know, God is, God wants, he, I don't think everybody's going to be called to come to this church. Now, I'm just being real with you. I wish that, what, what I'm saying is, maybe not, maybe not, they're all, not all called today to be here. Like, in other words, people go through different layers of their walk with God. That's right. And sometimes people are just kind of like coming in and they still kind of like holding on to their little sin, Right? And we've all been there. All of us as, as Christians have been in those places, if we're honest with one another. And we like to kind of pet our sin a little bit. And we, and we stroke it. And we cuddle it. And we hold on to it. Right? And, 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 if you're, and if that's how a person is in their walk at this point in time, they're not going to feel comfortable in a church like this. Because we're going we're gonna to preach the truth. Not, not to, and, and, and it's because of love. It's because of true love. Because if a person, if the word of God says that fornicators, liars, adulterers, uh, drunkards are not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven, then we want to make sure that people know if the word of God says homosexuals aren't going to make it into the kingdom of heaven, look, it's not just homosexuals, it's anybody that's living a lifestyle of sin. Amen. Amen. Uh, but, if, but, if I, but if it's in the word of God and it says that they're not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven, what kind of Christian pastor would I be if I sat up here like so many countless pastors and not even mention these things because I'm concerned you're not going to come back into the house of God. I'm going to have to stand before God one day. Right. And so not everybody's going to be ready to come to a church like this. But for those that are seeking and searching out their truth, if we will call on the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to show up, the anointing of the Holy Spirit will minister to people's hearts and lives. He will take the truth and he will drive it on the inside of them and he will begin to effect change. Let me tell you something, church. You that are watching on video, we, the church is in a mess. The church is in a mess, but God is about to start moving. He's yeah. about to start moving by the power of his Holy Spirit, and he's about to start waking people up. Right. And some people are going to wake up, and some people are going to stay asleep. And I'm here to tell you right now, it's going to be a sad day whenever the judgment goes down, brother, sister. I'm telling you right now, it's going to be a sad day. We need to wake up, and we need to be praying for pastors. And other yes. churches yes. that the Lord will wake them up. Yes. Because the Lord has already revealed to me it is not going to be a pretty sight when pastors stand before the Lord and they did not handle his word properly. The Lord rebuked me and showed me, you think, you think it's okay to have opinions. Let me tell you something, son. If you're over here preaching opinions and you're not bringing it out in my word and you're holding back on my word, you will be held accountable for countless souls. It's one thing if you get something wrong on yourself and that's between you and the Lord. You'll stand before God for your own, for your own opinions, right. right? But I gotta stand before God for my opinions that, that, and, and, and any wrong things that I said or taught from this pulpit. So no more can it be just what another man says and I go along with it. No, I got to make sure I study to show myself approved, amen, and pro present the truth, hallelujah, to give people the opportunity to receive the truth that they might be set free. Amen? amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. But there, you know, these weights and these burdens, you know, I didn't even realize they were there getting in the way. And they changed the way that we treat other people. You know, I've been hurt, so I hurt. You know, I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, because I, I know some of you people. I love you people. You're talking psychology. No, here we go again. I'm talking psychology. Y'all remember that? Y'all don't forget this because I'm going I'm to pound it in your brain. This word right here, suke, this is the Greek word for soul. Right there. Where do you think they got the word psyche from? They don't tell nobody this. Because they created their own science with a bunch of medicine and they moved Jesus out. We don't need you anymore, Jesus. We don't need you anymore. We're man helping man. We're the spirit of Babel, baby. We rebel against God. We don't need Jesus in our society. We don't need Jesus to heal people's emotional state. We don't need people, Jesus to heal people's hurts and pains. We'll just go ahead and put them on another prescription. One prescription after another prescription. Ups and downs and nobody's ever getting healed. They're trying to put band-aids on a problem that only the king of kings can heal. And if people would allow him in, he would heal them. 
But instead, many of us are filled with a spirit of rebellion. I'm not talking to y'all. I'm talking about them other people out there that don't want to yield to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And let him in. Help us, Lord. You know, thank you, Jesus. You know, it doesn't matter whether you use the word soul, heart, or mind. It really doesn't matter. All these words speak about a certain layer in the inner person, yeah. right? That we really don't know a whole lot about. I'm talking about the soul. Because, see, the heart, the mind, it's the same as the soul. I had a conversation with a very smart preacher recently. He's like, but the word for mind, for heart, for mind is nuance. The word for soul is suke. The word for heart is called, yeah, but it's all talking about the soul. Because, you see, the mind is a smaller compartment in a larger thing called the soul. I'm not trying to get too deep on you, but I want you to understand something. Your soul, it, you, your soul is who you are. As an individual, I keep saying this, but I want to get it into you because all of your past, all of your history, the things that you've experienced as a human being with your family, with, with your upbringing, the school you went to, the friends you hung out with, the music you listened to, the, 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 the first boyfriend or girlfriend you had, all of these things will affect your soul. They, they, they're embedded on the inside of who you are. And, and, and the mind, without, the, listen, we, you know what the Word of God tells us is that we are supposed to be led by the Spirit of God. Amen? Right? That's what the Word of God teaches us that, to be led by the Spirit. Amen? But don't we all know, can we not all admit that even as much as we know about the Word of God, that there's many times in our life that we're not really being led by the Holy Spirit the way we're supposed to be led. Amen. I'm just saying, I go back to the whole road rage incident. Hopefully that didn't happen to you today. Hopefully you didn't horn somebody and like, you know, think all kind of bad stuff. Hopefully, you know, you didn't let out a bunch of cuss words. Hopefully you didn't, you know, you, you get the point that I'm trying to make. Okay, but to be led by the Spirit is to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us and let Him do the leading and the guiding. Yeah. Amen? But many times, our mind is actually doing the leading and guiding. Help me out here. Now, there's a beautiful thing that can take place, and I know I've already taught it, but I'm, gonna re I'm doing a review for you. There's a beautiful thing that can take place whenever, see, if the mind is over here trying to control, trying to tell the soul where to go. We're not talking about the demon spirit right now. We're talking about us, our own mind, our own opinions about things that are not necessarily the opinion of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Because you know what? You were born in America, man. The Bible was not written to Americans. It was written to all human beings, but so many things in our mind. And hallelujah for America. Let's not, don't you put words in my mouth. Hallelujah for America. I've been to Singapore. I've been to Venezuela. I don't want to live there. Hallelujah for America. But at the same time, our American mindset is confused about a lot of things. Okay, and so our mind can get in the way, and the Holy Spirit is the one that's supposed to be driving us. But if we don't let the Holy Spirit do the leading, then now all of a sudden our mind is doing the leading. But a beautiful thing can happen when there's a flip-flop. Whenever our mind lines up with the Holy Spirit, hallelujah. <laughs> the Lord does want to use our mind. He doesn't want us to be a bunch of mindless robots, but he wants to be in charge. He wants to do the leading and the guiding. Amen. And, and, and I wanted, I wanted to say that because in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, it says this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit wants our whole man to be entirely sanctified. Yeah. He wants our, our, our soul, which again, I want to make this point, is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. Does it make sense now whenever you see people that are not maybe being led by the Spirit of God and their mind is all twisted off and they're being led by their own desires and their own mind and their own thinking and their own opinions, that many times our emotions will be full of chaos, right? Full of chaos. But yet if we let the Holy Spirit in, full of chaos, full of frustration, full of anger, right? But if we'll let the Holy Spirit in, praise God, he'll start to calm. All of those emotions. He'll start to bring 
peace. Instead of there being a raging river, there will be peace on the inside. God wants the entirety of our person to be separated unto the Lord. If our mind was already sanctified, we wouldn't have scriptures like Romans chapter 12, verse 2, part A. Be not conformed to this world, part B, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be renewed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word of the Lord, amen, going on the inside of our heart and the Holy Spirit taking the word of God, changing our mindset, changing our hearts and causing us to think like God thinks because he's given us his word for us to be able to know his heart. Amen. amen. You know, God doesn't want us hiding the weights and the pains from the past in a deep compartment in our soul. He doesn't want us drugging it away, drinking it away, taking pills it away, going to therapy it away. He wants us to bring it to him. And I'm sorry if that offends somebody, but I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry anymore to say that because Jesus, if you belong to the Lord, he wants you. I'm not trying to tell you that right now where you are in your life, you don't feel like you need to go talk to somebody. That's between, listen, you got your own personal business. Don't hear something that I'm not saying, but I'm telling you, Jesus wants you to go to him. Amen. It's offensive. I mean, if you think about it, it's offensive. Jesus died on the cross. So that the veil could be torn so that we could enter in. And he's saying, I'm standing here with nail scarred hands and I'm waiting to love you. I'm waiting to heal you. Would, you. would you come to me? Would you come to me? Would you give me a try? Would you give me a chance? Come on. The Holy Spirit would say that to you tonight. Would you give me a chance just to heal your life? I, if, if my Bible, if my word says I'm a healer and if you'll come to me, I'll heal you. Would you give him a chance? Hallelujah. How do I do a preacher? Just turn the radio. Just turn a worship song on and try it. Alone in the room. Read, read just a, a verse of scripture. And then turn some worship on. If you're not even a big studier of the Bible. And say, Lord, what does this scripture mean? And think about this scripture. And call on the Lord. And say, Lord, I need you. Just talk to him. Like he'd be your best friend. Call on the Lord. Hallelujah. And keep doing that. And the word says that if you'll draw near me, I'll draw near you. Watch what he'll do in your life. I guarantee, I challenge you. Watch what he'll do in your life. Don't let that spirit of God come up in you now. Like that old boy told me in the jail today. He said, I didn't really like you. But he said, that was a spirit of pride trying to keep me away from hearing what you had to say. See, the enemy will come on you. He'll come on you. He'll try to put pride in your heart. He'll try to prevent you from hearing what the Lord would say to you. Amen. Yeah. Lord help us. I know I'm not going to be able to preach this whole message. It always happens to me. I got to be mindful. It's a Wednesday night. Praise God. I'm telling you, I'm going to be mindful. But I did have a couple of scriptures. John 14 and 27 says this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled Neither let it be afraid. You know, the word troubled reminds me of those wadis filled with water because the idea is agitation. Actually, one of the words in the Greek New Testament for this, it, the word is royal. Have you ever heard of the word royal? It's spelled like boil, but with an R. I've never heard of that word before, so I looked it up. It means swirling, turbulent waters. Agitation, trouble. Jesus said this. He said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. The things in life want to cause agitation and irritation in our lives. But the word peace means, hey, listen, the word peace, it talks about quietness and rest. Wow. Yes. When we let the Holy Spirit in, he brings a peace. Yes. I talked to the hairdresser today, and I'm like, there was, had to be a time when you knew you were saved. She said, yeah, it was when I went to sleep and slept. Because wow. <laughs> for how much of her life she never was able to go to sleep. Wow. Chaos and irritation and dealing with her and, oh, Lord, other things. I mean, I'm not going to say her name, so I don't know that anybody will know. But, um, and other things happening in your sleep. Right, right. Come on, somebody, help me out here. Yeah. Every last one of us probably has experienced it, and we just act like we don't know what it is. No, it's weird. It's weird, and, it's, and it is. It's demonic, and it's the enemy trying to cause confusion. And if you haven't experienced it, hallelujah, you're protected by the Holy Spirit. You don't have to worry about it. We don't have to talk about it. Praise God. 
talking about sleep paralysis, but you don't have to worry about it. It's because you're protected by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Turmoil, agitation, irritation, but he comes to bring peace. The word of God says in Isaiah 9, 6, he is the prince of peace. Philippians 4, 7 says that he brings a peace that surpasses understanding. Hallelujah. Look at this proverb right here. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 23, and I think I'm going to close after this. I had a couple more scriptures, but I think I'm going to close because I want us, whoever wants to worship, I want us to be able to worship. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 4. Verses 20 through 23. He said, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their body. Watch over your heart with all diligence. For from it flow the springs of life. The, the, the wisdom writer is letting us know that we should pay very close attention to the words that God speaks, that we should incline our ears to the word of God. That means that if we're a Christian, listen, if we are truly a Christian, we should be. Let me ask you something, you young people. And I mean, I'm not going to look at you, but when's the last time you read your Bible? I mean, I hope that you're saying today. Praise God if you did. Well, hallelujah. When's the last time you read your Bible? Because if you're a Christian, you're supposed to read your Bible. Adults, when's the last time you read your Bible? Today. Hallelujah, sister. Praise God. But we're, as believers, we're supposed to read the Word of God. Amen? He said, pay attention to my words. Incline your ear to my understanding. Do not let them depart from your sight. Do not let the Word of God depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Why? Because they are life to those who find them. Amen? Then he says this, watch over your heart with all diligence. It's a big deal. That's good. I don't even think that young people can understand that. You can't even, you can understand it if you care to understand it. But you may not even care. To, I mean, I'm not trying to be a mean guy. I'm saying you may not care to understand it because it may not seem like that big of a deal to you. Because you're kind of young, and you're kind of still naive. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you know, but, but what the Word of God says this, it says, watch over your heart. And that means that if you got a cell phone, and your mama doesn't watch everything that you do on your cell phone, and you could be shooting text with some dude from the school, and he could send you. I believe in it. But you don't have to go that route. You can keep diligence over your heart. You can watch over your heart with all diligence. For from it flows the springs of life. Yeah. Diligence requires careful, persistent work. You got to work at it. What are you talking about? You better guard it. You better be aware. You better get into the word. You better spend time in prayer. Yes, you understand the message of the cross. I hope you do. I hope you understand that faith in Christ allowed your old man to die and allowed a new man to be resurrected to newness of life. And I hope you have a revelation of that. But you can have a revelation of the cross. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, you can still not apply it in your life. Amen. Just because you know it doesn't mean that you're walking in it. Amen. Because, see, the message of the cross says self must die. Yeah. That means the things that are not of God must die. And if we're not seeking the face of the Lord, our conscience can become seared. And we can pretend in our own mind that we're okay when in reality we aren't. Lord, help us. You know, real quick, I just want to share this with you. It says in Matthew chapter 15. And, and, and you know, I really have to turn there and we're going to close with, with this. But the Lord said in vain they worship me. They teach doctrines. They teach for doctrines, the commandments of men. And what the Pharisees were teaching is, you can't eat till you wash your hands. They had very ceremonial stuff going on. Jesus said, don't, don't you know that whatever you put in your mouth comes out the other side? That's basically what he said. It comes out in the draught. He's talking about, he, that's what he was talking about. <laughs> whatever goes in your mouth as far as you eating, but they were thinking they were more holy because they washed their hands a certain kind of way before they ate the food, and that if they didn't, then they defiled themselves. Jesus says, no, that's not the way that it works. It's not that which goes into the man that defiles him, but that which comes out of his mouth defiles him. That's good. 
Because, see, he says in verses 15 through 19, then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto this, us this parable. In other words, what does this mean, Jesus? And Jesus said, Are you also yet still without understanding? Do you not understand that whatsoever enters into the mouth goes through the belly and is cast out in the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. They come forth from the soul. And they defile the man, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Listen, the heart of man is revealed in the words that he speaks. Praise God. We need the Lord to minister to our hearts. Amen. We need to allow the Holy Spirit. Music group, if you could come up. We're going to close. We're going to close in worship.